Welcome back to the Foundations of Trauma-Informed Care series. During this module, we're going to continue our conversation about the science of trauma-informed care. We've been talking about neurobiology in previous modules, and in this one, we're going to focus on epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, and resilience. Epigenetics, in Western knowledge, is the study of how our behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way our genes work. Indigenous sacred knowledge has multiple teachings speaking to this knowing and honoring of this interconnectedness. Understanding this interconnectedness, understanding epigenetics, is important because it helps us to understand how toxic stress and adversity can be transmitted and experienced across generations. It helps us to understand the impact of historical and collective trauma for populations experiencing trauma over and for generations. It also helps us to understand the power of behaviors and environments to alter gene expression. It can also help us to understand that we might be having a reaction to an experience or a sensation that maybe doesn't feel like it's ours necessarily. Think of epigenetics as the feedback loop between our genes and the environment. Environmental exposures, stresses, diet, and lifestyle can all induce epigenetic changes that determine whether genes are turned on or off. Epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change our DNA sequence, but they can change how our body reads a DNA sequence. For many, learning about epigenetics can be an empowering experience, as this science challenges some outdated concepts that certain conditions are inevitable just because other family members struggled with them, like with cancer, addiction, or mental health conditions. Epigenetics can remind us of our agency and the significant impact of our choices. Adverse childhood experiences or otherwise known as ACEs, were originally defined as 10 potentially traumatic events that occur prior to the age of 18. In the research we'll talk about, adverse childhood experiences are linked to chronic health problems, mental health challenges, and substance use problems in adulthood. It's important, even before we even get started talking about adverse childhood experiences, that we, that we make it clear that adverse childhood experiences can be prevented and the impact mitigated and reversed. And we'll be talking about that through the, through the resiliency science. The adverse childhood experience study really filled in some scientific gaps between adver adverse childhood experiences happening, as you'll see in this pyramid, and how that leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, how that then leads to the adoption of health risk behavior, how that then led to disease, disability, and social problems, and that leads to years off of someone's life. So one of the contributions of the adverse childhood experience study was connecting that adverse childhood experience to adult health in a way that oftentimes when we were receiving adult physical health um, or mental health services, that wasn't always happening. So people weren't necessarily saying, oh, maybe these conditions are a result of childhood experiences. Instead, often we blame the adult for their be current behaviors in adulthood. The types of adverse childhood experiences that were studied were neglect, emotional and physical, abuse that included emotional, physical, and sexual, and household challenges including domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health challenges, separation and divorce, and having an incarcerated household member. As you see on the slide, a list of behaviors, lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, missed work, were connected to these, to these adverse childhood experiences. And then you'll see a list of physical and mental health um, kind of outcomes or impacts as a result. And I think if you sit here for a minute, you'll start to see this relationship between adverse childhood experiences, behaviors to cope with those adverse childhood experiences, and then the impact of those coping um, on our adult health and wellness to the point where we're seeing increases in heart disease, cancer, stroke, suicide attempts, depression, etc. The participants of the Kaiser Adverse Child Experience Study were 74%, almost 75% white, 46% over the age of 60, 
about 36% had completed some college, which another 39% being college graduates or higher. It's also important to note that they had Kaiser insurance um, and the study was done in San Diego. As one might note, that population being predominantly white over 60 with college education of some, of some sort with, with health insurance, it's important to say that it's not okay that it took that population's experiences of adversity and disease and disability connection for us to understand that when populations have experienced oppression um, have been sharing that for quite some time. It's also important or interesting to note that this population, which one might guess would have significant resources available to them, were still experiencing the impacts of adverse childhood experiences throughout their adult health. The Rising Youth for Social Equity, otherwise known as the RISE Center, built on this original ACE pyramid to include experiences of historical trauma, implicit bias, and the impact of adverse social conditions as a way to speak to the diverse range of experiences. What's very important is adding the like why adverse child experiences happen. You'll also see in this pyramid they identify microaggressions, implicit bias, and epigenetics. So I believe a more holistic viewpoint and an inclusion of kind of social determinants of health as well in this pyramid by RISE. More than a half of the general population has been shown to experience at least one adverse childhood experience and over one fourth experiences two or more ACEs and one eighth experiences four or more ACEs. Oregon has the ninth highest rate of adverse child experiences among the 50 states in 2019. So a question that, that is important to be thinking about is what are the pros and cons of routine adverse childhood experience screening? And this often comes up in the healthcare sector, um, this desire to screen for ACEs. And so really considering what, what might be helpful, what might be not helpful about that process. So when thinking of whether you should to screen or not to screen, some current, some current best practices and approaches are first we want people to know why. So why are you screening? Are you screening in order to collect data? Are you screening in order to develop a relationship or to help think through the best course of action? Make sure that you're able to share why you're screening. Can you practice an elevator speech or provide a script so that people are aware of the why you're asking them these questions? It's important that you think through how you do the screening, who's going to do it, that it never should be mandatory. You know, even thinking about being, you know, making sure we're trauma informing our screening process. So we might say, if you don't want to answer a question, feel free to say, you know, to skip the question. I even go as far as to say, if you don't want to answer this question, you can push this piece of paper across the table and I will move on. Because I know that it can be very difficult, one, just to access your verbal processing in that moment if you are feeling activated to say, I would like not, I would like not to answer that question right now. And also it can be, um, it can, it can be a big ask for someone to say that to someone who has a position of power or they feel like has power over them. And then, so not only why are you screening and how are you screening, but what you screen for matters. We're not only going to screen for adversity, we need to also be, be screening for resiliency factors and strength-based um, conditions. And then what are you going to do with the data? What, what now after the screening? So important things to consider if you're, if you're considering screening to screen or not to screen. Howard Penderhughes, Dr. Howard Penderhughes' framework for addressing and preventing community trauma talks about adverse community experiences. And that we understand that trauma manifests not only among individuals, but also at the community level. And then the interconnected relationship between the impact on individuals and therefore the impact on community and therefore the impact on individuals. And, and this is, a, I think, a, a more robust understanding of, of, of the relationship between structural violence, individualized symptomologies. So things like re-experiencing and avoidance also connected to kind of people in place and equitable opportunities in a community. The final body of knowledge we'll talk about is resilience. So in trauma-informed care, we look at programs and organizations and communities for examples of resilience promoting processes. So does that organization or community promote opportunities for service, for connection to others, for self-efficacy, and for self-reflection? 
We're also going to talk about in this idea of resiliency is some research called the HOPE research, which is the healthy outcomes from positive experiences. And in this research, they found four building blocks that promote hope. One is relationship. Two is environment. So having safe, equitable, stable, you know, living and learning and playing environments and positive school and home environments. They found the third was engagement, a sense of connectedness and social and civic activities. And the fourth was opportunity, the opportunity to play with peers, to learning, self-reflection, collaboration in art, sports, drama, and music. And what this research found was that positive experiences drive healthy development. And they don't just drive healthy development, but they mitigate, mitigate the effects of adverse ones. So, so the positive experiences that were looked at were, do you feel able to talk to your family about your feelings? This was for people under the age of 18. Felt their family stood by them during difficult times. Enjoy participating in community traditions. Felt a sense of belonging in high school. Felt supported by friends and had at least two non-parent adults who took genuine interest in them and finally felt safe and protected by an adult in their home. Many of these things are obviously within a family unit or in a home environment, but there are things here that are not. You could be the non-parent adult who took genuine interest in someone. You could provide opportunities for community traditions and participation in that. What's powerful about the HOPE research is that it has a dose response. So for those with exposure to adverse childhood experiences, those with more positive childhood experiences show better lifelong mental and relational health than those with fewer positive childhood experiences. So we wanna take a moment, because this is powerful research, we wanna take a moment and, and think about how or can we, or are we incorporating positive experiences into our workspaces and places and, and organizational policies and procedures. This is a quote by Zandashi Loria Brown that I think has really resonated with many people. This says, I dream of never being called resilient again in my life. I'm exhausted by strength. I want support. I want softness. I want ease. I want to be amongst Ken, not patted on the back for how well I take a hit or for how many. As we talk about resiliency and we talk about post-trauma growth or adversarial growth, we want to make sure that we're honoring that resiliency is that, you know, you don't just bounce back, right? Because for many people, bouncing back to something that was oppressive or not healthy is not, is not desired. But then instead, we're striving for systems and places and spaces that provide a foundation where people can thrive and where we can buffer impacts and that we can focus on healing 